Thanks for coming to the. Uh, oh, my pleasure. I wish I could stay longer. I missed the best part. With the cops, we're really excited about it. Um, we had a lot of attendees last time with a lot of good questions. Um, our hope is really to bring the police department out to you in the community, get to hear your issues, get to tell you what's going on in the police department, um, answer those burning questions that you have about why police do the things they do or what's going on in your neighborhood. Uh, we're really excited to announce uh, some community outreach efforts that we've been doing lately. I'm going to introduce uh, one of the captains that was fundamental in putting this program together which is uh, Captain Pete Ballou. He's going to introduce staff and start with an introduction. Um, the way we have this set up, we have about 20 minutes or so, maybe 25 minutes of um, just kind of letting you know what's going on, what we think uh, you want to hear. And then um, for the rest of the discussion, um, you'll tell us actually what you want to hear and um, we'll be able to answer your questions. So, uh, Pete. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you. Like Chief Spagnoli said, happy to be here. Really excited about this program. How many people here? Anybody here at the first copy with the conference? Okay, so if we have some help of returnees, you know the format. I want to change it a little bit today. I want to introduce staff. Then I actually want to take one second because we're in a smaller setting. Just go around the table and do what's called a 10 second introduction. We'll talk about that in a second. So here today we have uh, Detective Sergeant Doug Calcagno. He's actually acting lieutenant right now. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't announce Mr. Pola, our council member, Mr. Pola, but he, he's, he knows. He's here as a copy of the cop member, not really from the police department. So I'm sorry, I should have introduced you first. <laughs> That's not the don't know. Know. And we also have uh, Officer Chris Albert. He's one of our traffic <laughs> officers currently. Um, community Compliance Specialist, he's a supervisor, Bill Baptiste, he's a supervisor of our code compliance unit. <laughs> officer Mike Benz, who I used to introduce as one of our newer officers, but that's not the case anymore. We were just talking about that. Uh, they've hired, uh, they've hired a lot of police officers since Mike, and Mike's been around for a while. You may not have seen him because he used to hang out on the night shift, and now he's, uh, he's working days. And then many of you know Officer DeBrano, who works out of the crime prevention office, and then now everyone knows if you didn't know before, Chief Sam Respect really the one that's responsible for spearheading this and catalyzing us getting together. What I want to do, just to get a sense of who's in the room really quickly, and it's really quickly, it's, hi, I'm John, I'm a community member, I live in blah, 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 or hi, I'm so, so everyone knows who everyone is. Is that okay? It's like a 10-second hi-bye, and then we'll move to the next person. We'll start right here. I'm Marianne Paris, soon to be Marianne Perry in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. I'm Dave Perry. I'm the other half. <laughs> and you live, you live in this district? Well, oh, I lived in Walter Garden for over 40 years. I've been in San Diego virtually my entire life. Great. Thank you. Jim Prola, council member. One Lamb work with uh, Boy Scouts and also Lions Club. San Diego. Marion Wetzel, lived here since 84. Okay. Uh, Inga Parker, lived in San Diego since 69. Thank you. You're welcome. We're doing introductions. I'm Margarita Lacave. I've lived here since 2000, but I live in the McKinley area. Thank you. I'm Patricia Minnis. I'm with Citizens for Safer San Leandro. Hi, I'm Joey Hornbeek, and I'm a member of the Downtown Business Association. Hi, my name is Paulette Nolan. I'm the owner of Soto Creative, and I also manage uh, 19 units over on Caraway. Thank you. My name is Dan Brown. I lived in Oakland for 10 years, and uh, well, thank you for getting started on time. Oh, no problem. <laughs> oh. I'm Marilyn Singleton, and I'm also from Oakland, but I'm interested in crime because of our gang injunction issues. And Which part of Oakland? Um, near Montclair. Very good. Well, mm -hmm. Thank you. Nice to you. I mean, I'm Gilbert. Uh, we manage uh, Balcourt Plaza apartment in East 14, San Leandro. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. I remember you were here. Though. And a couple other new people came into the room. Uh, I'm May. I, I think there are over 30 girls, and we want to learn more about the, um, the procedure here. Great. Welcome. Yeah, my name is Kate. I live in over, almost 40 years right here. So I like to learn about you guys. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Claudia McHenry. Uh, I'm also with Citizens for Safe and San Leandro, and I brought some brochures. <laughs> And a couple other people have come in the room. We'll just introduce them, and then we'll move on. This is uh, Sergeant Ricky Costa. He's patrol supervisor. Sorry, watching the streets this morning. And someone else who's quickly calls out. 
from Perfect. Well, a couple things. The format is very informal. As you can see, we're sitting around some tables with a little bit of coffee. It's for us to have a conversation or a dialogue. But this morning, we wanted to open it with about 10 to 15 minutes of a presentation, maybe a little longer. If we can get the web to cooperate with us, we're actually going to showcase one of our current projects that we've just launched that uh, the community is really excited about, we're even more excited about. Uh, and I'll say that hopefully we'll be able to get that up and be able to show you. A couple of things just to catch you up on what we've been doing. It's been a very busy last 12 months, 9 to 12 months. Uh, one of the things is last year we got awarded a $2.4 million by the federal government for a cop hiring grant. And as you know, it takes time to get people on board and get people trained. It's, you don't just go out and hire someone the very next day. It takes a little time to get those folks. It's really come to fruition. We've, we've been aggressively going out and, and, and recruiting. We were able to hire five police officers that were get, getting laid off from San or three of them getting laid off, but would have gotten laid off by San Jose PD. So was, we were very happy about that. We have we got top-notch officers that we hired behind this grant. What that has allowed us to do uh, is, and they're finishing their training. In about three to four to five weeks, they'll be done with their training. What that's allowed us to do is, is maintain a crime prevention officer, Officer Kovacs' position. And some of you know Officer Kovacs is crime-free multi-housing, crime-free business, very involved in the downtown association. Uh, we also have, we're able to reinstate one school resource officer, which took our complement of school resource officers from two for the San Leandro and San Lorenzo School District, because we have some of San Lorenzo School District. Yeah. Three. So we have three school, we'll have three school resource officers, back up to three, which is where we were before. If we were up to us, and we could, we'd have ten. I mean, you can never have enough people working with our youth, working with our young people in the schools. But right now we'll have three. We were able to reinstate one bicycle officer, so basically we doubled our bicycle unit. It gives us seven day a week coverage in the high pedestrian areas. It's not just the downtown, if there's something else going on where there's going to be a high pedestrian event, uh, our bicycle officers are, are very good, very adept at dealing with those issues. And then two more TAC officers. And uh, I don't remember if someone else was going to explain what our TAC officers do or not, but they're a special patrol unit. They don't really go out and take reports, per se, if your car gets broken into or vandalized. We don't send the tactical officers. Their, their mission is really to be proactive, to go after people that we, we know are wanted. If a crime occurs here, they're responsible for following up that crime and control. They have follow-up responsibility for serious crimes. So if, a, let's say, a, a, a burglary occurs in a store, a robbery occurs, and, and we get a little bit of a lead, or we get a partial plate, or we get a suspect description, or something that leads us, maybe even out of town, the TAC unit can respond because they don't have responsibilities for a beat here in San Leandro. They're able to do the special investigations and do some follow-up that our patrol officers just don't have the time or resources to do because our patrol officers may be responsible for investigating that crime, but they're also responsible for thirteen to fifteen thousand dollars, thirteen to fifteen thousand residents that live on their beat. So it's it's a balance. The TAC officers really help us in terms of being able to go after the, the people that committed the just occurred crimes. So that's pretty exciting. We also launched, and we want to plug, do a plug. We just had our second or third, I think it was our third Citizen Police Academy. Graduated it in, in, in the summer, June or July. And, and that's coming up again in March. We start taking applications as early as December, January. So if you know anyone that's interested in participating in our Citizens Academy, it's always full. There's always a waiting list. It's a very popular program. Uh, so if you're interested in that, either see myself or Officer Grano after this, and we'll, we'll steer you in the right direction. There's actually an application process that you can go through. More importantly, what was even more exciting this year is in the summer, as a follow-up uh, to the Citizens Police Academy, we launched our first teen academy. And i got to tell you, it was a little scary, because until the two weeks before, we only had six people signed up for it. Then all of a sudden, everybody came forward, and we ended up with 20 or something to start and 16 to finish. And, Everyone in the police department knows when the Teen Academy is going on. Everyone at Carlton Plaza knows when the Teen Academy is going on. Because they're out front doing PT. It sounds like the Marines invaded the police department. And they make them sound off. And I mean, it's the, the, the kids love it. We had a few kids the first day. The chief was talking to him, asking him, why are you here? Are you enjoying yourself? And, and uh, a couple of them said, I'm here because my mom made, made, made me come here. I don't want to be here. And, you know, it's interesting because the comment she made was so appropriate. She said, you know, I think that if you stay, you'll, you'll see that you get some value out of this. At the end of the program, those were some of the students that got the most out of the police academy, out of the teen academy. They, were, they loved it. You know, it's not necessarily they want to be cops, but they got a different view of the challenges that law enforcement officers and law enforcement professional personnel face today. Really a good program. Really, there's not enough programs in most communities that connect with teens. This was very effective. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a plug to Officer Toronto, who was the one that ran it all and was their, quote, DI for the 10-week program. 
uh, has a he has a magical way of making making the young people really focus and pay attention. I remember I was in there watching one day, and he, and he holds up. He says, "What are these? They're no notepads. What are these? Everyone has a notepad. He's hold them up. Everybody's holding them up. They're a little bit uneasy because they don't know what's going on. He goes, "We've been talking for an hour and a half. All of them are blank. Nobody's taking one note. Get your pens out." <laughs> it's just the way that he deals and interacts with youth that really holds them accountable, but they know they're loved at the same time, and then and they move forward. At the end of that academy, they were looking sharp, and you know, it, it was just a really good experience for our young people. And I know Boy Scouts does a lot of that kind of thing, where they're building building bridges and building relationships with young people. So we want to put a plug in for that. That'll be next summer. But if you know anybody that will benefit from attending the Teen Police Academy, we'd love to have them oh, yeah. apply. Again, there's an application process. It's interesting because with traditional schools. About four to five weeks into the summer, kids are going crazy. There's not enough to do. They're bored. They're crying to their parents. Mom, I want to do this. I want to do that. Parents are going, hey, we can't do all that. Well, the Teen Academy can take a little bit of that off of parents and things, too. And give the students something that's really positive. Looks like we got uh, something more good. We're up. Used to send so, um, I, there's two ways we can do this. Did you want to talk about the next part of the program? Well, we can actually hit all that here. Okay. Perfect. Uh -huh. So, Officer DeGrano, for those of you that don't know. Okay, uh, how many folks do not have access to the internet at home? Don't have access. Okay, do you use the library at all? You do for the for the internet. Okay, um, same thing. You just have to bring up uh, the website. We have some new programs um, that are on our website now, and you can get through them by either going to the city's website, City of San Leandro, which is www.sanleandro.org, or you can get it through our homepage, the www.sanleandro.org, and go to the police department page. Okay. I apologize for this not being uh, a little bigger, but I don't have a longer cord, so I think it's, it's all good. Um, if you bring up our homepage, this is exactly what it looks like. Okay. And off to the left is going to be everything that you need to know about, or anything that you want information on. This will just take you back to this page again, so we'll just refresh it. But some of the things that we're asked about, like Code Red, who knows about Code Red? Not a whole lot. All right, Code Red is a system that you would go on here, and from here it gives you the link so that you can sign up. It just asks for some very basic information, address, phone number, and things like that. I can't find you. And I know a lot of people don't like to give out information. Uh, I be in one of them. People call and they want this, that, and the other, and you don't want to. This takes a minute. That's right. Or two. Um, once you sign up on Code Red, it allows our dispatch center. If we have an event, natural disaster, we, the police department has a perimeter set up, we're searching for somebody. We can make it as large as we want or as small as we want. So we can do a block or we can do a whole area. Okay? And what this does is once you sign up, it will give you all this information. If it's a natural disaster, a fire, a gas leak, something like that, it'll give you an evacuation route. Where we want you to go, where we want you to meet up at, so we can take accountability of the people at those addresses. And the way it does it is by dialing your phone number. And I think you can put several phone numbers in there, actually. You can put your cell phone, or you can have those of you that have it, it, uh, it rolls over to your cell phone, and it'll allow you to get that information. So, for an example, we on uh, up in the, the hill up in Bay Vista about two years ago now. Uh, it was one of the first times we used it. We chased a vehicle into that neighborhood. Uh, they bailed out of, the, uh, out of the car and they went up into the hills, actually up into the foliage and, and uh, we were searching for them. We had a pretty good perimeter set up. Well, we activated code red. It was kind of new to us, so the dispatchers didn't dial it down quite enough, so we were getting calls from people who had gotten that emergency call all the way down by 150th Avenue, all the way down here into the manor, we kind of, it was new to us, we were kind of playing with it. Uh, and they wanted to know who we were searching for. Well, those folks that did get the call within that area, within the perimeter, were very thankful. And in fact, one of those neighbors w was able to give us some really good information and we ended up catching one of the suspects. Uh, she didn't go outside, she locked her door, and as she was going to lock her back door, which had been open, she spotted the suspect hiding behind the shed in her backyard. Mm -hmm. So we were able to catch, so that's what it does, it gives you the information. And if you're not home, It'll leave a message. I think it tells you how many calls it can make within the, the 60,000 phone numbers per hour. It has that capability. It's free to you. All you have to do is sign up. Okay? And again, that's natural disasters or any other emergency that we deem you need to have that information. Okay? And we use it quite a bit now. All right? 
Uh, the next one would be. Um, ah, there we go. This is new. Ted, yes. Question. Yes. Um, for the code red, I was thinking, can I give my home address and as well as my work address? Because it will be. I believe you can, but it won't. It won't dial up if it's out of the area. It no, won't. no, I work in San Diego. Oh, okay. Yes, it will. Okay. It will. So if it's a business that you have, it'll certainly if something's going on in that area, it'll dial that business number. Sure. Sure. The daily activity log. When you click on daily activity log here. This is what it'll give you. It kind of gives you a, well, there's a disclaimer. And it also gives you the restriction of use, right? If you click at the bottom, it's very small, but it'll say daily activity log. This is what it looks like. This is basically the same kind of screen that the officers have in their cars, on their laptops, which is what they write reports and get calls from. Gives them a description. Only this one's been dialed down a bit because there's certain information you understand that we cannot put out. Everybody get that? Yeah. Um, okay. But we want you to know what's going on. So, uh, let's see. Here on Alvarado, 1600 block of Alvarado, officer was hailed. That means that somebody flagged out down, hey, I need help or directions or I got a flat tire or, you know, one of the other. And this gives you what the disposition was. Adjusted. So it probably was directions, a flat tire, or can you meet me at my house because I just uh, couldn't find a cop there and don't have a phone. So I flagged you down out here on the street, but I need you to go back to another location. Uh, a disturbance, traffic stop, 911 wireless. Everyone knows we have that capability now. When you used to call 911 on your cell phone, you know where that went, right? Yeah. The letter, CHP. And then they had to connect you to whichever agency you're near. So there's a lag time. Now we have where you can dial 911 on your cell phone within our area, and it'll go to the dispatch center. Okay? It's the same dispatcher that picks up the phone if you dial on a hard line. Right? So the only difference is, is that if you're on a cell phone, you absolutely have to get the information out very concise and very clearly, because as we all know, those cell phones calls get dropped. So, yes, ma'am. So what does adjusted mean generally? Adjusted? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Patricia, you know, flags me down and says, hey, listen, uh, I lost my dog. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't want it to get hit. It's been out before, but can you help me out? And we will. And let's say two minutes later, I find, we find the dog. Get it back to Patricia. My disposition on that would be adjusted. Found the dog. dog. Okay. It's adjusted. Or two kids are arguing at the bus stop. You know, somebody stole my pencil, won't give it back. Believe me, we get those calls, a million of them a day. And we go and we adjust it. Hey, give them back the pencil and they'll take that. Okay. Okay. Right? So that's adjusted. So the, and that's what that is. And so that's why we give that his bump. Here you see there was a traffic stop made, 700 block of Lowelling. There was an arrest. That's all you'll know. You won't know what the arrest was for. So it could have been drugs, it could have been a warrant, it could have been a DUI, could have been anything. But there was an arrest made from that traffic stop. A self-initiated activity, you know, the officer was out there being proactive, saw somebody, he or she determined that that person uh, was uh, subject to arrest and was. Okay. Um, you'll see things like this where it'll say none given for the disposition. If it was an auto burglary, sometimes it doesn't pick up what happened. There was probably a case number issued for that. And they're not going to put the report number in there because it really it's meaningless to you. You just have to know that. There was an auto burglary. It was at a 900 block of Llewellyn. So if you live in that area, now we should always be a little uh, cautious as to what we do, right? We don't leave our Christmas packages in the car, right? Who leaves the Christmas packages in the car? <laughs> we don't have the club on the seat and the removable stereo still in the car, right? Because <laughs> we see it, do we not? Yeah, we see it. So you might want to know, hey, I'm going to be a little more vigilant, right? Because somebody down the street got their car broken into. And if you have a neighborhood watch or you're really close-knit with your neighbors, you may go down and find out who that was and find out what was taken. Sometimes these crooks will go out and they'll take things that they take all the time. Change out of your ashtray, stereos, that's all they take, just stereos, right? Uh, or anything that's visible, a purse, a briefcase, something like that. Okay? So that's how it works. Any questions on this? It says it doesn't post everything. What doesn't it post? Well, if we have like a domestic violence type thing, that's you know kind of privileged. Uh, you know, sexual assault, uh, something with a child. You know, a juvenile. Uh, we can't release information like that. How about the tattoo party murder? The tattoo party? 
Um, the call may have been put on there as whatever it came in. But you know who it was? It was on the local news on Yahoo. What's that? You know the local news? Uh, Yahoo. Mm -hmm. get all that information. I got it from there. Oh, okay. So you get, yeah. Well, they will post it, and then Patch. Yeah, post it, yeah. Patch as well will go out. They'll get a story, yeah, and they'll and they'll put it on the on the internet. But as far as the calls that you will see, um, they're probably going to be pretty vague. Like that one probably came in as a, maybe a shots fired type thing, and that's what it'll say. Oh, they're going to bring it up right now. That's the other thing. I'm sorry, I skipped that part. You can go to the date. Up at the top, right under where it says daily activity log, you go to the date. Uh, now here's another thing with that uh, with that call there. We had a uh, 911 call on a uh, wireless. In the 600 block of Marina. That could have been somebody who heard it, saw it, whatever, and hightailed it out of there, but called as they were leaving. Yes. Do you post Amber Alerts? Amber Alerts. Do we post Amber Alerts? We have the ability to post Amber Alerts on our web. On our oh, e-notify okay. system. On the e-notify. That's the other end. We'll, I'll, I'll show you that. So, Tim, um, uh, just to clarify on the reports, um, the reports don't get posted until it's closed out. So if it comes in as a disturbance and it gets closed out as a homicide, um, a homicide won't get posted. But where a homicide would be posted, and I'll show you in a minute, is you'll go to the press releases. You can go to the press releases and pull all the serious crimes. You'll actually get a story about what happened rather than a little log entry. So um, a crime won't get posted. If you see the police at the house across the street, it will not be posted until it's dispoed out. Um, we just give blocks, we don't give exact addresses, so you don't have to worry about calling us, like your address is going to come up. It um, defers to the 100 block, um, not an exact address. And then um, the only thing that we keep confidential is um, medical calls, um, mental health issues, the sexual assaults, and those type of crimes by law are confidential, so we don't post them. But always check the um, police, um, they're called um, press releases, and um, those specifically will give you about a paragraph or two on what exactly happened on the incident, um, like the homicide we recently had. Any other questions? Okay. The, this, this is useful for the press as well because you can print a PDF version of all the calls for service on a certain day. When you, and it's right there. You just click on the link that says print PDF or print Excel. And it'll, it'll actually put, bring it up in PDF, and then you can print it on your computer for there, or you can just get a summary of all the calls that have occurred for a certain day going back 30 days. It's, pretty, it's a really exciting program for the public to be able to see what's going on. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you tell us more or less what percentage of calls will not be there? Which percentage? Yeah. I don't know by percentage, but I can tell you the types of calls. Like I, like no, I but I mean, like, just to get an idea, because when I look at this, it doesn't seem like you have that many calls. I mean, given the 100 or so. Uh, uh, officers, but if there is a, another amount of calls that are not called in, uh, I mean, it, it, would be, it would get a better idea of what the workload is. All of the calls that come up, and they are how far apart? When do they update? Every five minutes it updates. Yeah, every five minutes. So if you look at that entire call for service on yeah. that time and that date, that's by time now. Mm -hmm. It's going to be up there, and there are quite a few. This screen obviously didn't show anything if we didn't scroll down, but it's on there. So you're you're looking for the average calls for service? Is that what it is? Well, I, how many per day? Yeah, per day. Per day. Yeah, we get almost yeah we get about almost eighty thousand calls a year. So if you divide it by oh. you know, the, how many days a year, okay. you can figure out about how mm -hmm. an, an average. So okay. we get a lot of calls per day, um, and then a lot are confidential. So okay. um, just to give you. Um, an example, um, over one year when we implemented E911 last year, over a one year period we had 18,000 calls increase in our dispatch center um, from 911 callers. So that's a huge increase over a year, especially when the population, it was the same time where the population increased as well. So um, it's eight, about 80,000 calls a year we get annually. Okay. Yes, um, oddly enough, I was sitting here thinking uh, when, when she said there weren't a lot of calls. I was uh, sitting here thinking as I look at this, I think, oh my God, how do you guys 
handle all of these calls. Because I think of San Leandro as being small. Um, I lived in a few, until four years ago, I lived in San Francisco. And I think, oh, this is small and it's quiet, but it isn't. There's <coughs> tremendous amount of activity. And as well, there's this personal part of things that happens in San Leandro that quite frankly doesn't happen anywhere else uh, that is absolutely wonderful. Part of that is the, uh, like I mentioned, the close-knit neighborhoods. Uh, and our neighborhood watch programs. Um, folks look out for each other. Uh, I don't know because I don't work in another city. Another, I never have. 23 years it's been all here. Um, and that part of it has not changed. Calls for service, that's like everybody else. They go up. Uh, we have basically the same amount of officers that we had you know, a while back. And uh, we're a full service department, so we answer each and every call. Some departments do not do that. In fact, many departments do not do that. Uh, the barking dogs, the alarm calls. It wasn't too long ago that Fremont PD, and I don't know why they did a press release on it or whatever, and had a, but they would no longer answer commercial burglary alarms unless they knew that it was in fact in progress. <laughs> mm. well, I'm, I'm not a genius, but how do you know that it's in progress if you don't go? Yes. Um, is it helpful to report uh, crimes? Um, like for instance, I had someone came and took my copper out of my building. Um, is it? And I don't know. Metal theft is huge. I don't know when it happened exactly. <laughs> um, and is it important to report those? After the fact. Yeah. After Absolutely. The fact, does it help? Absolutely. Okay. Because you may have been one of you know 15 businesses in that area, and we, and we need to know that. We need to know, we need to have that data. Um, and then if there's an insurance deal that maybe you know you need to report anyway. Um, and they may have left something behind that we didn't get at one of the other calls that maybe you didn't notice, but we go out and go, oh, well, here you go. So, yeah, absolutely, even after the fact. And one of the tough things, too, investigation-wise, <clears throat> when something like that happens, um, even though we can't tie serial number or anything like that, we may have just stopped a truck that had a ton of copper in it. And if we don't have a report of it, if we can't somehow find you or get it back to you, we can't prove that it's stolen. We can think that it is, and we can take it, but then proving it in court later is yeah. impossible, and our DA won't charge it. So when you guys find things like that, um, and then to, to hit on that, if you have anything that has a serial number, write it down somewhere. Take maybe 30 minutes if you can, and then keep it in a thumb drive, keep it somewhere. So if it gets taken, that's really a lot of times how we prove that it's stolen uh, a year later. Yeah, I just had a question because I kind of have a consistent problem where I have people coming in and stealing the plants in front of my business. And it's kind of a stupid thing to report. I don't feel like I want to, yeah. you know, spend your guys' time, yet it costs me like a hundred bucks every time I replant. Well, I mean, it's costing you. Yeah. <laughs> but we have, but what's, what? What did you stall? Is, is uh, Sogo Creative on East 14th? Um, um, people are sick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Uh, my other question is: With Ani's 14th, we have quite a few of the got the um, the big people yeah. sell, saying they're selling promotional items. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're coming in your business. They're disturbing things. They're really aggressive. Are they allowed to be there? You have to be permitted. You have to get a business license. You have to get a solicitor's license through the city of San Leandro uh, in order to do any of that. So should we we be reporting? If you get someone that comes by, especially daily, or they're always out in the place, or they're always in sure you could call, you don't have to get involved. You just made the call, so you, you, you've you done your part. <coughs> we'll send officers out. The officers will check to make sure that they have what they need to have. If they do, that's fine. If they don't, then they're moved along. If they continue to do something like that, they can't be cited. Okay. okay? They can't be cited. Tim, can you talk about online reporting, smaller things? Mm -hmm. So, in speaking about these crimes, like the plant theft, let's say that uh, you come to work every morning, which is probably how it happens, right? You see, oh, yep. you know, the palm's gone <laughs> again. So, those are crimes where you, you don't have any suspect information. Let's say there's no cameras, there's no witnesses, there's no, you have no suspect information. It's a petty theft is what it is, right? Petty larceny. You can go online. Let's say your insurance is going to cover it, but you have to have a police report. You can call it in and wait for an up, or you can do it yourself now, because we have what's called online reporting. Okay? A lot, many agencies have it and have had it for a while, um, but we, we now have it, so you can go on and you can fill out your own report. Now, there are restrictions and uh, limitations. So obviously, if there's suspect information, you, you'd want an officer to come out and report that to the officer. 
Uh, if there's witnesses and things like that, then we have to gather that information and take statements from them. If it's a, a felony where somebody uh, obviously stole something, you saw it, like your car, and you saw it happen, and it, okay, that, you're not going to report that online. You're going to call the police and, and report it that way. These are crimes where uh, maybe you go out and your side mirror and your door's crunched in a little bit. Uh, it was a hit and run. Obviously, nobody around, no evidence other than the broken glass. Your insurance company wants a report, right? You can go online and do that. It generates one for you. Uh, you, you just type in the information. I just have one last question. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have uh, someone available at the station now that will take a report if you go in there? Yes, during certain hours. Because I went in one day and they went to the home and called and will send somebody out. Sometimes we have the one uh, during certain hours. And I can't, what is that now? Uh, the record is closed. Yeah, the records is closed for, for that portion. But then sometimes you have one records person that's down there. And if you can imagine, they're doing all the other stuff too, so that's why we can't. But right, um, because it, you know it'd be quicker than having a police officer come to the station to take the report from you. Although it puts you out uh, if you wanted to. Yeah, no, no, we don't have a police officer in the station, but uh, some reports, like the ones that you can do online, you can do at the counter as well. But this just makes it so much easier for you, uh, especially if you have it there handy. What, what is your guys' opinion about um, businesses on East 14th and when they're patrolling at night with lights? Like, I've been leaving the light on in my business because mm -hmm. I have a lot of computer equipment. I've got a huge 60 inch in there. And, I mean, I'm sure people look by, but they want to hit it, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, what I've been doing is trying to leave it well lit. Do you guys look at that stuff? I mean, we are do. you? We do. And is that a better thing to do? Is it better to have it light <coughs> or dark? Or? Two, two trains of thought. Some people would say, you know what, uh, I close everything up so they can't see what's in there. Uh, but that limits us as to what. What you guys happen or is happening, right? Um, or people want to light it up and let everybody know what's in there so they can see someone that's inside there. Uh, personally, if I had a business like that, that's probably what I would do. Now, how many business owners? Just real quick. You have a cash register? Is it a retail type thing? On, on site, on sale, point of sale? No. Okay, those of you that do, take the money out of it. <laughs> Open the drawer and leave the drawer open so everybody can see there's nothing in that register at night. Okay, if you have a safe, do it that way. Uh, if you have to take it home, just do it in the daytime hours and make sure you're not the team. Yeah, so a lot of people leave it in there and uh, they get taken out. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I have another question about reporting possible crimes as you see them. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if you see like two people really speeding quickly up is 14th and you don't know, maybe they're racing, maybe they're just running away from a city of a crime. Do mm -hmm. I call the, that in? Sure. And how about, uh, I mean, because in many of these situations, it seems like you won't be able to get there on time anyway. But you take the chance of, we might, because if you called it in, let's say here on Alvarado, uh -huh. hey, this guy, you know, he's going 100 miles an hour, I think. Yeah. It looks like it anyway. Um, and then you have an officer, maybe that's not right here, to get right behind it. Yeah. You may have an officer on Marina, and if they continue to go straight, you gave a good description. Oh, uh, okay. Right? Okay. So we get it. So yeah, I always call. And, and do I call the regular number or 911? Uh, you could call, well, it depends on what you see. I mean, if, you know, if they are completely erratic and uh, over the lines and you know, narrowly missing people, it's 100 miles an hour, that's unsafe. So that could be a 911 call, sure. Okay. If it's somebody who's speeding, you know, just passing traffic and going, yeah. uh, that's going to be a call you'll have to make, but you can dial a non emergency number. Okay. okay. Tim, can I just. Sure. Can I one thing you have to understand as far as the dynamics go with our communication center, when you call in and you're speaking with the dispatcher, a lot of folks are under the impression that that one dispatcher is not only taking the call, but they're also the ones responsible for getting a radio call out to the officers on the street. The reality is, is that dispatcher is immediately typing in the information that you're providing, mm -hmm. and there's another dispatcher in the same room who's reading that information real time. Mm -hmm. That dispatcher's sending officers to your call as you're talking to the dispatcher. Oh. Mm -hmm. So don't ever think that there's a delay as far as, there's always going to be a little bit of a delay, yeah. but while you're talking, they literally are getting this information real time <coughs> and officers are being sent to that location. Okay. Uh, you, may, you may put out, I, I just had a call yesterday where there was a couple of suspicious people in our neighborhood and I happened to be driving, it happened in the area of San Jose Street, mm -hmm. and I happened to be driving on Estadillo yeah. Avenue. The call came out, I turned the corner, I'm right, the ladies, Still on her phone, standing on her porch, and she goes, oh my god. <laughs> but it's, it's something, it's, we get lucky sometimes. We're in the right place at the right time. But don't be fooled. That call, as you're talking to that dispatcher, continue providing as many details as possible, because she or he or she is not stopping 
to furnish that information to the field units, that's someone else that does that at the same time. Okay. And we are clairvoyant. <laughs> Any other questions about that? Any questions about online reporting? Very simple. Uh, you'll want to read through the beginning part of it because it tells you what you can't report, um, and that kind of helps you out. And uh, if you have any questions about it, I'll, I'll be here afterwards uh, if they're lengthy. Okay. Um, if I could just touch on one thing. So I think you asked, um, somebody made a mention about staffing, and you almost have 100 police officers, and you don't have very many calls for service a day, and so um, there must be a lot of downtime. Well, we don't have 100 officers. We have 89 officers. Um, and then you break it down to how many are actually assigned to uniform patrol. And um, so out of 89 officers, how many think are actually assigned to the patrol officer function? How many people? 20. 20? It's actually 45. We have um, seven beats, is that right? We have seven beats. And any time you have about um, anywhere between about seven and 15 officers uh, per day on patrol, depending on uh, the time of day. And so you may ask, what are, what are the other officers doing? Um, we're included, meaning all your command staff and the people that manage the department are included in the number of officers you have because it's a sworn count that we keep track of. So you have your police chief and your captains and lieutenants and sergeants. Um, the rest of the officers are assigned. We have about um, almost a dozen uh, detectives and investigators. And then we have specialty units. When you talk about some of the grant funded positions, uh, we have three school resource officers. We have two officers assigned to um, crime prevention and community outreach. Um, and when you break that down, is those programs are great and we're still allowed to continue it. But the reality is, when you have between 7 and 15 officers um, on the street, there are times where um, we have uh, no available units or only one or two available units. And so um, the numbers are deceiving until you break down how many officers we have and what they're doing. So um, we're fortunate to have the CROPS grant because without that, we wouldn't be able to provide things like the school resource officer program. Uh, you see we have two officers assigned to the downtown B, um, specifically down from the downtown merchants. We also have one officer part-time, so half their shift is assigned to uh, the Bay Fair Mall. So um, those officers aren't count, they aren't, aren't um, in our complement count for our day-to-day -day, um, serve calls for service. So um, that sort of is a clarity of how many officers we actually have. Good idea, Bay Fair Mall. What was that? I said that's a good idea, Bay Fair Mall. Yeah, you know, uh, when you look at the statistics at Bay Fair Mall, I mean, obviously um, the shopliftings. Um, have that and street street outside too, you know, people are costume and everything. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, what's amazing, and, and what I said earlier, is about 80,000 calls a year that get entered, mm -hmm. right? Some come in, don't get entered. 24 hour a day, seven day a week operation, 14 districts <coughs> total deal with all those calls. Not 14 at a time, 14 versus 24 7. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's the, main, the, the call volume that comes in. Uh, it's pretty amazing, and, and the job they do is unbelievable. Yeah, Jerry. Does does uh, Bar Police help you guys provide cover if they go? We need it on a case by case basis. Yeah, we'll call them. They're often quick and they're quick and they're they're available. <laughs> we help Bart also. It's a it's a two way. A um, couple other people in the room. I did want to make mention of. If you don't know, we're on Facebook. Any Facebookers here? Oh yeah. Okay, we're Sam PD is on Facebook. You can go to our Facebook page. You have to be a member of Facebook to go to our page. And you can like us, and you'll get updates. You can also put click on the thing where you want to receive updates. And every time a press release goes on, every time an informational release goes on, if we had an Amber Alert, we would put it on Facebook as well. It's real time. You can also there's a link on here. I don't know where it is. Luis Torres is not here with us today. He would know where it is. And if you're a Facebooker better than me, you would know. You can look. You can click directly on your Facebook and link to our daily activity log to see what's going on on your phone. It might be a little small, but you you could you have that availability. We have a couple other people that came into the room. Uh, detective Sergeant Mike Sobeck, he's our Special Investigations Detective Sergeant and supervises the Fraud Unit and the Domestic Violence Unit and the, I think the proper group. And then also Detective Neil Goodman and Detective Daryl Ramsey, they work out of our juvenile unit um, as juvenile detectives, but it seems more and more that they do less and less of the, people have a misconception about juvenile detectives and what they do, and they actually are you know, very hard-hitting, serious detectives and do a lot of good detective work and help whenever needed on the adult side of the house also. We wanted to move on because some of you probably have some, some questions or some issues or burning questions about what's been going on recently. And we 
Acting Lieutenant Doug Calcagno is not only a detective sergeant who's been responsible for dealing with many of the, the issues that have occurred lately, he's also our press information officer. So he has the most current information available on some of the big things that have been happening in Santa We want to take, give you a few minutes to listen to what Doug has to say and ask questions around that. And then after that, we'll have time for any questions or answers or questions you might have. Good morning, everybody. No. So, uh, I've been uh, acting as a lieutenant for uh, about a week and a half, and from probably the first couple of days of doing that, um, it seems like our investigation division and our police department has been busier than it has ever been before. I can't remember a time that uh, we have uh, been experiencing the types of crimes that we have so consistently. Uh, so, one of the things that I did this morning was I just printed a couple of my press releases um, that uh, I had written, and I had forgotten uh, probably two or three of them because there's been so many uh, of cases and really good cases that we had uh, from dating back to just September 28th time period. So, uh, like the previous speakers have said, we have about 14 investigators, somewhere around there, uh, up in investigations, and it's, it's broken up with vice narcotics, the juvenile division, uh, into what we call the bullpen, which is divided into based on property crime versus people crime. And uh, so when something major happens, such as the case right down the street uh, the other day with the triple homicide, basically everybody works together. And they work together just like on the TV show, 48 Hours. Um, it's just pretty much nonstop. Uh, so when you see me on TV, there's a little little asterisk here. Please don't judge me because when the when the uh, when the bags under my eyes start getting really heavy, sometimes it feels like 15, 20 pounds. Uh, it's probably because myself and everybody else that's been working hasn't been to bed for upwards to 24 hours uh, without any sleep. So um, it gets very hectic. Um, and I'll just go over a couple of the cases. Um, obviously, the, the most recent case was the other day, um, two nights ago, uh, the resisting arrest uh, situation that occurred downtown uh, with the individual. We were called on the individual that was at Nations. Um, yeah, I know about it. Yeah, right, right. So, um, officers respond, they get into uh, a confrontation with the individual, and um, uh, he doesn't listen to what the officers are saying. He's acting suspicious. Uh, ends up getting into a struggle. At which one, one point, uh, right? You did. You did read the article. <laughs> and uh, they go down to the ground, um, and uh, an officer deployed a taser during the confrontation, which was uh, ineffective. Uh, the guy was about six foot, two hundred twenty pounds, and he was really, really strong. So more officers were called. Uh, they eventually they were basically able to get on top of him, control his arms, and then handcuff him. And then immediately, upon being handcuffed, he just basically his health goes way downhill real quick. Medicals en route, and they start treating him. He gets transported, and he dies. Um, so it was a really kind of unfortunate situation. The four officers involved in it happen to be probably four of the nicest officers that we have in our department. Um, and uh, you know they are dealing with uh, the interview process and going through that whole thing. One of the tough things uh, in our line of work, when something like that happens, what we do is we have to deal with a couple of the, the issues that are going on, policy-related issues. When somebody passes away like that subject did, uh, we start looking at the policy side of things, we start looking at the criminal side of things, and then we put those officers on a standardized administrative leave. Um, so all that's happening, the <coughs> administrative leave part, um, Obviously, doesn't mean that they did anything wrong. We're just putting them on leave in case something has to change or something did go wrong. We don't want that to. We don't want them to be out on the street uh, in the meantime. So, on the face of things, sometimes people, folks, will think, "Oh my God, they did something wrong. They can't even let them work now." So that's not the case. It's a standardized way of, of how law enforcement in general handles things. So. As we're dealing with that today, um, obviously uh, two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, uh, the triple homicide occurred down the street. And uh, you probably most have read about it, but in a nutshell, uh, party, tattoo themed. Uh, it was uh, advertised on Facebook, which is uh, something that is an um, up and coming event. It's happening everywhere in the Bay Area, and I can only assume it's happening, happening throughout the state. Um, but uh, they have this party, unbeknownst to law enforcement, 
about 200 folks show up, give or take 50 to 100. Um, there was no clicker going on as people were walking in the door, hanging out in the uh, parking lot. And um, one of the issues that comes up is uh, when you have a group of youngsters and the average age was probably in the early 20s. Obviously, one was 16, 16 because that was uh, one of them that was um, that was murdered. Um, they come from all over, and everybody has has uh, baggage and uh, people that like them and don't like them. And one of the tough things in this particular case is um, uh, we don't know who was all there, uh, what friends or enemies they've had, and uh, one of the things we're working on is what we talk about in the press a lot is the motive. I mean, we're trying to find out what that motive is. Um, is someone targeted? Uh, was somebody in the car or somebody that was murdered targeted? Was somebody that got away without being shot targeted? So those are some of the things we're working on. Obviously the result was three dead, three others shot. Um, the three are recovering. Um, there's a couple worse than others on the ones that were shot and survived. Um, so we are uh, still working on that and trying to develop leads. One of the things that I said a lot in the press, and it really is true, there were a lot of San Leandro uh, victims in this particular case. Um, and so we're dealing with um, issues uh, that occur a lot in Oakland in terms of trust of the police. Um, everyone's heard the term snitch, uh, you know, situations like that. So we're kind of dealing with, you know, trying to, to just really plead to the, the community that was there, the uh, participants, that they have information to come forward. But we have to deal with some of the stigmatisms that they have for us, trying to get them to trust us. Uh, we have anonymous tip lines, we have other ways that they can get a hold of us without leaving their information, just to give us a name, to give us somebody to focus on. So we're in the process of working. There's some uh, cooperation that we're getting, which is keeping us busy, uh, but uh, we're actively working uh, that case and, and obviously trying to find these, these violent criminals that, uh, that did this. Um, mixed in all these uh, deaths, we end up having traffic accidents. Uh, we had a pursuit uh, where there was a, uh, just a, a minor crime that occurred. Uh, at one of our food max, uh, you know, over on the welling, the officer does a great job. Sees a car speeding away, um, doesn't know what happened, thinks something might have happened. It's driving recklessly, tries to pull it over. It fails to yield. The chase is on. It's two-ish in the morning, uh, real light traffic. As the suspect vehicle is uh, going at a fairly high rate of speed, it crashes. Uh, three out of the four occupants in that vehicle uh, die. Two pretty instantly. Uh, probably didn't know it hit them. Um, the survivor of that crash is in pretty bad shape, although it's going to survive. So uh, we have another pretty traumatic incident, a couple officers involved, uh, administrative leave, evaluation of policy, just the whole thing. So um, pretty busy period of time uh, that uh, we're working hard on. Yeah, you had a big standoff cases. down in San Leandro Central. Yeah, I mean, we didn't get into the SWAT incidents oh, yeah. uh, that we've been a part of, but uh, our SWAT team's probably been busier this year than it has been in a while, and pretty close period of time. One of the running jokes was uh, exactly one week apart within 10 minutes. Uh, we had two SWAT call outs at uh, 10 o'clock ish at night, and that was just uh, uh, a couple out of maybe five or six in a couple of months. So we've been busy, and the last one was the one on Central, where it was the Richmond homicide. Yeah. And uh, it ended. Uh, and a shooting. So, well, questions? No, no, I, just, I just really have a comment because I think it's not said often enough. Um, with those two instances of the one at Nations and the, the kids that were killed um, in, the, in the car wreck, and you know, I think that you have to be held accountable for yourself. When a cop tells me to stop, I stop. Um, I really think that what you do out there is a great job, and I don't think you hear it often enough. And I think too many people try to um, make Oscar Grant a hero when he was nothing but a thug, and the cops are getting a bad rap, and I really think that I'd like to change that somehow if there were some way. Just by me speaking out today, maybe I can. Well, that's very nice. and. and uh... <clears throat> You know, that's well said, and we appreciate it. We really do. We appreciate it. You know, everyone uh, you know that we work with here, we we all you know uh, really are focused on making folks' lives better by protecting and serving. It's a real simple mission statement that we have. 
Um, and you know, when we come up with the obstacles, you know, that we're dealing with there, and we have to deal with some major public, you know, perceptions. And, and one of the uniqueness of this job is that we could be doing things absolutely perfect, but if Oakland does something, if Alameda County does something that the public you know, questions. It really, it's a community. It's reflected on all of us. So we need citizens. Like, you, I'm going to vote for you for citizen of the year. <laughs> no, no, seriously though. Um, how many years ago was it that the uh, the officers were killed in Oakland? Like, like three, four years ago. Nobody, nobody stood up and 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 demonstrated when they were, you know, when they were killed. And if and if I stood up and demonstrated. Um, say in reverse demonstration of what goes on with Oscar Grant. They're still trying to hero, make him a hero, and it just is sickening to me. Um, I'd be called on the line for racism or bigotry or whatever. That of which I'm not, but you know, it's like I don't go out and steal because I don't want to. You know, I don't want three hots in a cot. Um, I respect the law, and I just. It just irritates me when these people try to make a hero out of a villain. Yeah, and we do face these challenges, and, and I was looking around the room doing a count of it. I know a little bit more about the officers probably than most people on that side, of the, that side of the table. And six of us either are from here or live here now, and uh, we rely on each other, not just the six. We rely on each other, the, the men and women in blue, um, to help get us through tough times. But we also rely tremendously on the support from the community. And your statement, although it, you may not think it's said often enough, we do get a lot of positive feedback. It makes it really a pleasure to work in San Leandro. I'm glad that that It helps us get through those tough times, those 24-hour, 48-hour shifts. It's not the end-all, do-all, because we still have work to do. But it, what you said is appreciated, and that is a sentiment that makes it a real pleasure to work in San Leandro. I mean, it, it really does. Um, it, it, we wanted to spend some time for you. If you have, we have a whole resource of people, cognitive people here. If you have any specific questions that oh, yeah. we can answer. You know down in Olive Street, it's a nice quiet area, but there's some people that drive like 50. You know me, it's just soon by. You can get the driver's license. I know they live around there on the other side. It would be nice, you know, to put a stop to it. Do you call us when they're doing it? Mm -hmm. There's other people both called in already. <laughs> <laughs> Will you call us too? And Officer Albert works traffic. He can probably answer that as well as anybody Oh yeah. Is, you there, know, is, there, uh, is there a specific time of day more they usually, home? you know, at night time, okay. when it gets dark, it's a, it's a black car, sports car. Oh, it's so just, it's a specific vehicle that's yeah. doing it. You know, a lot of times when I've been out there, I told them to slow it down, you know what I mean? Because, you know, they can. Get their license plate. How are you going to get the license plate if they just zoom like that, you know what I mean? And around the corner for 26. Well, it's obviously somebody that's probably in the area. Yeah, he lives in that area. He lives down there somewhere, either Central or the other side. If I wouldn't know the car, I go there and I write it down, you know. Officer Albert will find him and give a ticket. But you know what? <laughs> you know what? You know where, where the hot dog place is on this Yes, I know exactly. And you know where, where the yeah. parking lot is, and then on the front there is somebody always parked there, a big truck, you know, uh, long Are they in the landscape. Parking lot? No, outside on the landscape, but on Olive. Oh, so they're parking on their driveway. Yeah, he parks that. That's outside. And he parks there, but. What I'm saying, him parking there, you driving them up there, you can see if anybody comes from the parking lot out. Oh, sure, I understand what you're saying. And I think they should put a red marker there because I almost got hit because I, you know, they came out of the lot and I was going slow, so I was able to stop, but I couldn't see it. Okay. From the hot, from the I'll, parking I'll make a note of that, that. And, and we meet with the engineers from time to time. Yeah. That's that's their portion of the whole thing. See, it's a it landscape of truck or parks there. Okay. Maybe, maybe just at the end of the meeting, just hook up with Officer Albert. Absolutely. Yeah. We, yeah. Our traffic officers have a way of going and talking to people about their driving. Now, what is yeah. it? <laughs> get well, oh, in that part, we we do like with engineering. Put a red marker on there. You know, like we'll, 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 we'll hook up when we're all done, and I'll give you my card, and we'll try and address that for you. Thank you. Okay. Maybe on that Other marker. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I have a question about um, administrative leave. Is that a set amount of time, or is it just for the so, time of the investigation? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so it's case by case. Uh, the priority of an administrative leave is twofold, right? There's a criminal investigation, and there's an administrative investigation. Um, obviously, if there are criminal allegations, you know, we wouldn't have somebody working with their criminal allegations. And the second part is administrative, um, and the mental health of an officer. Um, as you can imagine, um, seeing three people um, killed right in front of 
you is something that an average person doesn't have to deal with, right? Um, coming back to back and dealing with a homicide of three people the next evening. Uh, if an officer sees that, you can imagine the amount of trauma that they're actually going through as well. So uh, the administrative leave is twofold, and the second part is to make sure that um, we do an appropriate debriefing and make sure that the mental health of our staff, not only the police officers but the dispatchers, are appropriate to be put back in the field. So that's the sort of the reason for it. Um, got a lot of questions um, recently also about tasers and uh, what they do and how they work um, and why we use them. Tasers are a best practice. Um, they're actually a very useful tool. They uh, reduce um, injuries to peace officers. They work um, in a very simple way. You can use them two ways. Um, officers um, can use them really to um, gain control of a suspect who we can't gain compliance in another way. Uh, there's, a, there's a fallacy out there that tasers kill people. Um, and actually, um, if you read every report that anybody has been killed um, associated with a taser, is um, tasers has not been the primary cause of death um, in any case, um, and Taser International, the company that puts that out, um, is very um, active in um, defending their use of that equipment. Um, we think it's a good practice. The majority of peace officers are using it. Um, it's a very low level of force. You don't necessarily need to use it with the darts. You can actually use it to taking the darts off and using it um, as a stun gun. Um, and it's an effective tool, really, um, to maintain control of somebody um, who's not complying uh, with peace officers' requests. So um, I think um, it's unfortunate sometimes there's fatalities associated with it um, based on somebody's medical condition or history. Um, but you have to remember the people that we're dealing with, um, they could cause injury and even death to a peace officer um, otherwise if we didn't use control. Um, and, and you have to ask yourself, um, if we have a large man and he's fighting with two officers and officers can't control him because he could be um, dangerous, um, what would you rather see? Would you rather see the officers take out their sticks or use another device that could control them? And if you just think about that in your mind, um, they have a simple way to control someone. It's an effective tool. It's a common practice in this industry. Um, and sometimes there's that piece of police work we really don't want to talk about, but it exists. And it exists for one reason, is to keep your peace officers safe, but also to keep the community safe. Because what if the officers say, we can't control them, um, I need four of you, go out and try to get that guy here, the handcuffs, you know, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Think about that. Right? Um, yeah, it's, it's not really, it, and so we think about it as um, it's an effective tool in this business. So um, that's why we use tasers, and that's why many departments are transitioning. It's a lower level. Pardon? do the body. Um, actually, so what it does is um, it actually um, restricts your muscles so you can't move. That's what it feels like. Yeah. Maybe um, they have to lower them down a little bit, the pressure. So it's one, yeah. It's one, one level. They don't come at different levels. Um, the so you can, big guy and small person, you know what I mean? And they have that on high, and it can kill you. Yeah, there have been um, many studies. You can go to Taser International and read all about um, tasers. Um, but it comes in uh, one speed, and you can choose anywhere between one and five seconds, meaning it's set for, it stops yeah. after X amount of seconds, yeah. So um, if you've ever been tased, which I've been tased, it actually, you can't move. You can't move, and it just. How can, how can that um, happen that that didn't control that man of nations? Yeah. Well, What's I, it on PCP? Our um, preliminary results right now are showing that, um, you know, a lot of the officers couldn't really even get a full contact with them or control them. So think about it. It's easy to control someone when they're standing there, right? But when someone's hands are flapping and you have officers that are trying to take someone in custody, um, it's a very difficult situation. So, yeah. So some of these people, I would imagine, who, who would, uh, anyway, would be mentally ill. Uh, do we have somebody in the department who, can speci who specializes on people with mental disorders and who might know how to approach them rather than a suspect but somebody who is just ill? Yeah, we um, actually have officers specially trained to deal with mental illness, and we're actually going through a transition period where all our peace officers are going to be trained um, to specially deal with um, issues um, with mental illnesses. We know, we get about, um, how, many, how many mentally ill uh, calls for service do you think we get a year? Plenty, I think. How many? I don't know, plenty. Out of the 80,000? 15? 15,000. We're about at, almost up to 1,000 a year, and those are documented. 
So those aren't just the mentally ill that we don't classify um, as uh, mentally ill calls. So we certainly deal with a lot of the calls. Um, they're unpredictable, obviously, and so we do have people um, specially trained. I know Chris is one of the people that are specially trained and maybe can speak about the program or... Uh, certainly. Um, it's a, a specialized training that um, came out of the East Coast, um, and Oakland is actually spearheading it in uh, Alameda County. And it specifically trains officers to deal with people who have mental health issues. Now, when we deal with mental, people who have mental health issues, sometimes they're violent. And, and we're trained to react and to do things a certain way to protect ourselves and the public. However, this specific training goes above and beyond with regards to dealing with the families um, and, 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 and dealing with and, and understanding what people who may have paranoid schizophrenia are what they're going through and the, the training specifically helps to instead of us having to go hands-on with someone mm -hmm. which typically is what happens when somebody's in, a, in having some sort of mental health episode yeah. is that it helps us to learn other avenues uh -huh. to maybe to be able to gain compliance so we can get them brought down to a level where we can deal with them so there is that training going on and it's excellent actually it's some of the best training I've been through in years. There's one other person in the room, too, that's been through that specialized training. Yeah. Detective Ramsey went through it. And then all officers receive basic training in dealing with mentally ill in the academy and then also as part of our training program. And so with a thousand calls a year, all officers get exposed to dealing with the mental illness. Oh, yeah. So we'll take one more call. And I mean, one more call. Oh, call. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't had this hand up for a long time. Oh, uh, we'll take two take more two. questions. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, kind of twofold question. Uh, one is, is there much of a youth uh, violence or gang issue here in San Leandro, and then just to speak briefly on that, actually, and then more so is the the, the solution rather the lucky for more about what programs or resources do we have? Sure. Um, so I'm going to let uh, one of the detectives talk about um, the juvenile detectives talk about what's going on with our kids, uh, just really briefly. Um, the second component I can answer right now is um, that we are seeing obviously an increase in violence related to kids. We do have some gang activity in town um, that we're well aware of and that um, we have a unit specially focuses on that, focusing on that issue. Um, I'll let Anil talk about um, our new diversion program that we're bringing back and then what he's seeing with the kids. Um, I know we're almost done so we'll keep it brief. Um, basically our gang problem in San Leandro is, is uh, generational. Uh, it goes back uh, a couple of decades. Uh, beginning uh, primarily with the Hispanic gangs. Yeah. Uh, they divide San Leandro, uh, an imaginary line somewhere about Marina Boulevard between northern and southern San Leandro. Uh, Davis Street Locos is the uh, Hispanic gang that's in the northern part, and the Manor Drill Boys, who have gone by other names, Manor Park Gangsters in the southern part of the city. Uh, the northern folks associate typically with uh, the Oakland gangs from the 30s and the 90s and various other parts of Oakland, uh, those being the avenues. Uh, and this, the Manor Drill Boys associate more with the North Side Hayward uh, gangs who affiliate with uh, people on A Street, uh, Tom Trump's Locos. Uh, we take gang crime very, very seriously. Uh, my job as an investigator is to uh, focus on the gang aspect of the crime, while another investigator typically investigates the crime itself. And I develop all the intel, compile that. Uh, typically these reports are about 20 to 30 pages long. And what they do is they, in our most recent case, we had a shooting that occurred at McKinley School about two years ago with Dave Street Locos. The gang enhancement takes a crime that would typically range from a three, six, or nine year sentence to a 25 to life. So the last case that we, we had involving gang crime was uh, this person received a sentence of 22 years. So, um, there are programs that, uh, that deal with uh, gangs and gang intervention. Part of that being uh, occurs at the high school because people start off, or youth start off in gangs at a pretty early age, 12, 14 percent, <clears throat> and they continue throughout their adult life. Some people drop out. Um, we are working on some diversion programs in addition to what the probation department currently uh, provides. 
Um, we'll take one more question, Thank and then um, what I'm going to ask is that um, we have a few people that will hang out because we want to respect your time. Um, we have, a, as, as they said, um, Officer Albert specializes in traffic, so if you have a traffic issue, talk to him. Uh, Bill Baptista supervises our community compliance. If you have a weed problem with a neighbor or a vehicle abatement or blight, <laughs> stand in line and actually talk to Bill and he'll take care of it. Um, Officer Benz is one of the beat officers, so if you have a problem, especially if you live in the Manor area, that's the area that um, he patrols. Um, and then our Juvenile and Investigative Bureau is, is going to be here for a few minutes. But uh, let me handle the last question and we'll close. I want to go in a little different direction. Uh, you talked about $2.4 million. Was that was a grant of yeah. some kind and other grants. What can we do as citizens to help you get more grants? Do we have to talk to our senators, our Congress people? Yeah. The, 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 yeah. The, um, there's that? a lot. Um, the, 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 to be quite honest, um, the money's drying up at the state and the federal level. So the access to the money, we're doing a good job of having access to our senators and our elected officials to get some of the money. Uh, one of the things in the programs I know that uh, Captain Ballou is looking at um, that we just went some onto some training that we'd really like to move forward with, which actually you can help with. So uh, when we're done, uh, talk to uh, Pete, Captain Ballou, um, is we're trying to start a foundation, particularly for the police department. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit. Um, obviously, and it's a way that uh, we can work and interact with the public and businesses um, really to raise funds to do um, special projects, whether it's um, that we lose our canine and we can't afford to buy a new one and we can fund something like that, um, or we can do larger programs and we can bring gang inter intervention programs into the schools. We can do um, more things in the community than we have the money to now, including you know adding peace officers as well. So um, it's something that's um, typical. A lot of police departments are starting. Um, you need to establish a 501c3, is that right? And um, so talk to Captain Blue when we're done, and um, would love to have community support. Um, it's a community board that runs that type of a program, uh, along with the police department. So it's something that we're taking a look at and seeing if there's an interest in the community. So we have a lot of great resources, big businesses in town. So most departments, um, especially our size, have something like that. So we're looking at that. So um, in closing, thank you for participating today. I want to be able to answer all your questions. Uh, so please be sure to talk to our staff before you leave. And we also want to respect your time um, for those of you who have to leave at 9 o'clock. So thank you again. <laughs>